Let's well, bring in yeah, go mind, ahead. Uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas, who is a stranger, who is no stranger, in fact, to this program or to the impact of deadly tornadoes. He's ha having dealt with a number of them as the governor of Arkansas. Uh, governor, good to have you with us this morning. You see the reports. You've seen the images now for going on about a day. What's your reaction? Brings back a lot of uh, very, very traumatic memories. Uh, first of all, on a personal level, I was in two tornadoes, one when I was 11, another one that hit when I was uh, living at the governor's mansion, hit the neighborhood. Uh, devastating tornado in January of 1999, killed 27 people. Uh, tornadoes are just a horrific occurrence because they happen so quickly. And in the case of the one that hit uh, Mayfield and throughout Monette, Arkansas, and other places, it happened at night, which makes it even more tragic mm -hmm. because a lot of people are asleep when it comes. They may not be aware that it's on its way. Uh, and then in the aftermath, it's very hard to see what's happened. But one of the things, Will, that I, I think people need to understand, tornadoes tend to impact poor people disproportionately, and for several reasons. One, they're underinsured or maybe uninsured. They often live in structures that maybe aren't as strong as uh, a nice, well-built home that has been built recently. So they're more vulnerable. And then they have less resources to try to recover. So this is a long-term thing. And, and I think one of the tragedies is when a storm like this hits, for a few days, everybody will be covering it, and then everybody will forget it. And uh, can I pay tribute to Samaritan's Purse? one of the great relief organizations that exist because they stay until the work is done. And they mm -hmm. don't just come in for the first few days and help with immediate relief. Uh, they're still in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And you probably haven't heard about Lake Charles in a while from the hurricanes. But that's the kind of long-term help that people in Mayfield are going to need. Yeah, you know, Samaritan Purse is one of my favorite charities. I, I contribute there as well because of exactly what you said. They stay for the long haul um, and, and not the short term. Tell me what, because we saw the images that uh, Rick showed us. Obviously, no one's there. People are in hotels um, and finding shelter in other places. I, I can understand what what, they're, what they went through physically. It must have been traumatic. But tell me what emotionally they are going through right now. Well, there's a sense of loss. There's a sense of shock. Uh, a lot of people, it's going to be several days, maybe weeks, before it really sinks in what, uh, what happened to them. Mm. And there's another piece of what their lives that they're trying to figure out. They didn't just lose photos and memorabilia. They lost their Social Security card, their Medicare card. They lost their driver's license, uh, passports. They've got to recreate an identity. So they're going to have to deal with a government that right now in that community is also devastated. So it may be that the state will bring in a specialist who will come and set up a uh, like a mobile center to help people recreate their identity, get their driver's license, get their identity cards, get the things that they need to, to be people again, uh, because they've lost everything, their checkbooks and, and the stuff that they're used to having. And especially when it happens at night, it's on their bed stand, it's on a, you know, on a, mm. a table somewhere, and it may be 35 miles away. They'll mm. be having people call them and say, hey, I found a checkbook with your name on it. What do you want me to do? Uh, it's, it's a bizarre thing what happens in tornadoes. It, it just is uh, almost inexplicable to see that one house will be perfectly pristine and next to it, it's blown completely off the slab. And there's no explanation other than it is a force of nature that no one can ever just uh, ignore. Well said and spoken um, from firsthand experience, uh, uh, the, the depth of the human cost of something like this. And we're going to continue to cover all those angles this morning. Governor, we want to get your take on a couple of other topics as well, if we could, starting with this. Uh, you saw first you've got the Mississippi case before the Supreme Court, the pro-life case uh, at 14 weeks, which is which is pending with the court. You also have a Texas uh, abortion law, which bans abortion uh, effectively at six weeks. Well, and, and the Supreme Court said, we're going we're gonna to leave that law in order, uh, but challenges can be made. Well, Governor Gavin Newsom in California has a take on the Supreme Court's decision in that particular case and how he wants to apply it to a totally different issue. Here's a portion of what Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, had to say. He said, if states can now shield their laws from review by the federal courts that compare assault weapons to Swiss Army knives, then California will use that authority to protect people's lives, where Texas used it to put women in harm's way. So he's saying, because of the way the Supreme Court ruled on pro-life, 
um, he wants to use that same approach to ban guns in California. Can he do that? Two quick observations. First of all, the Texas case is under review by the courts. That's the whole point. It is being reviewed. It's just not being enjoined right now. So he, he needs to get his facts straight of what's happening legally. And the second thing, when Newsom talks about uh, the idea that it's the same as uh, guns, he doesn't seem to understand that there is a second amendment to the Constitution. It's part of the Bill of Rights that we can defend ourselves and we can bear arms. There's nothing, not one word in the Constitution about abortion. In 1973, the Supreme Court created it out of thin air. That's the whole reason for the controversy. And so when he talks about that, he just speaks of a level of ignorance that is stunning for a person who's uh, the governor of one of the largest states in the country. You know, to that point, and Governor, I'm sure you heard this, during oral arguments on the Mississippi case, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas kept pressing that exact issue that, that Governor Huckabee is talking about. What right are we talking about specifically? Mm -hmm. what, what right is being inhibited here? Is it a right to privacy, a right to general liberty? It was a fascinating exchange that illustrates the, the point I think that you're making, Governor. Well, and the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment make it very clear that you cannot deprive someone of life or liberty without due process. Well, the life and liberty of the baby is yeah. being denied due process and is being destroyed. I, I never have understood why we don't make this an issue not so much about privacy or states' rights. Uh, the whole issue would be settled once and for all if we recognize the personhood of the unborn child from the moment of conception. When that individual becomes a human being, uh, as much as it ever will be. And the DNA that is created at the moment of conception is the DNA. If that person lives to be 98 years old, it'll be the same. So that's what we need to be focused on. I think it's what Clarence Thomas was focused on. And if we ever fully understand that, that's the constitutional provision that ought to be discussed. You cannot deprive somebody of their life or liberty without due process. And that happens every time that we take the life of an innocent unborn child. Yeah, and Governor, that's an argument we'll win because technology has given us a window into the womb. I mean, these people who are defending uh, choice, as they call it, um, are have a very antiquated, <laughs> deliberately antiquated view of fetal development. We know exactly what happens in the womb now. It's very hard to deny the, the humanity of, of a fetus. Um, you just have to not want to, want to believe it um, because the science is yeah, there. three words. Yeah, three words, follow the science. They tell yes. us this all the time. If we follow the science when it comes to uh, the life of a human being, uh, we don't have abortion anymore because the science is pretty clear on uh, when a, a baby is actually developing, and especially in the laws like Texas, where it's about a heartbeat. When you can see the image of the baby and you can hear the heartbeat, it's hard to say, ah, I can't tell, it just looks like a clump of cells to me. No, it really doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Those 4D ultrasounds are spectacularly vivid. Um, well, speaking of following the science, SNL just took on, uh, Saturday Night Live took on Fauci and COVID dining restrictions. Um, I want you to take a look at this clip and see what you think about it. When people see me on TV, they think, oh, this can't be good. <laughs> and their children think, wow, that elf on the shelf got old. <laughs> With COVID cases on the rise, you know, people still have a lot of questions. Is it safe to travel? Can I still use this as an excuse to get out of stuff? So to help answer these queries, I once again invited members of the CDC to act out various holiday scene lists. The CDC players present going to a restaurant. <clears throat> Hi. I'd like to eat Christmas dinner at your restaurant, please. Sure. I just need to see your vaccination card. I actually can't find it. You mean you lost the little one-inch piece of cardboard they gave you? I'm afraid so. Then you are banished from society. Have fun living in the woods. OK, and scene. That, that's not right. You can get a replacement card, I think. Governor, is the jig up? I mean, when SNL is taking on Fauci, who was, you know, practically a god to liberals um, not too long ago, is, is this the end for him? You know, mockery is the very finest form of comedy, and that's what's going on. I'm so happy to see that at least Saturday Night Live and some other comedians are beginning to recognize that this whole thing has been playing out in a way that is uh, stomping all over people's basic fundamental rights. A friend of mine went to a restaurant yesterday in Little Rock, 
got there and they said, where's your vaccination card? Now, she's been fully vaccinated and said, well, I've been vaccinated, but I don't have my card with me. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, you won't be able to come without your card. She looked around. The place was about empty. And she said, I'll never go back. I mean, I think it's not just government, but it's businesses that are trying to uh, uh, become the mask police or the vaccine police. And it's backfiring. People are tired of that. Uh, certainly, they want to be careful and not get COVID, but they also don't want to lose their basic fundamental rights, not just as an American, but as a human being, for gosh sake. And I'm thrilled to see comedy beginning to uh, finally just pull the covers back and say, the emperor has no clothes. Mm. It's true. And maybe because the, the most draconian ongoing measures are happening here in New York City, it is the actors of Saturday Night Live who are now impacted right. by a little bit themselves, and maybe they're done with it. Yeah, so true. Who, I who, think that's a lot of it. Whoever yeah, thought in no America, doubt. show me your papers. I, I never. <laughs> oh, we're here. I think we're somebody here. should disrupt Saturday yep. Night Live. I don't, I, I'm not convinced they're coming along to see the light. I'm convinced they need to be going ahead and replaced. <laughs> There's a huge opening. <laughs> Anybody that's funny, there's a huge opening right Yeah, there. Greg Gutfeld's proving yes, that there is. every day of the week. Governor, Governor great Mike. to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you Merry all. Merry Christmas. Christmas.